Luke chapter 22. Amen. The last of our mentions is on angels want to help. <clears throat> Amen. And praise God. I know your spirit, praise the Lord, has been blessed. And that, that word is working, amen, unconsciously inside of you. Amen. And that your spirit is building even a greater relationship and conversation with your angels. Amen. Because they will definitely indeed build upon the revelation with you that you have heard. <clears throat> now let's zero in on uh, and something that you might not think that the angels get involved in. Amen. Something I was made aware of when I was in Israel. And that is travail. Praise the Lord. Right there. Amen. Those of you who have been to Israel or who have seen <clears throat> the Jewish people at the Wailing Wall. Because that is a part, amen, of the old temple. That is the only thing that is left of the temple. It is down below the temple mount. Amen. Where Muslims have they worshiping place. Of course, the devil will try to claim God's ground. But Ezekiel tells us, amen, in the coming days, that the temple will be built right across from the, from the Dome of the Rock. Amen, right across. The only somebody that can make that possible is the Antichrist. The only somebody. Amen. As the, as the, it is not the Arabs that guards the Temple Mount. It's the Jews. <laughs> and they, drew, they guard it because the Orthodox rabbis will raid that mountain and take it by force. <laughs> so Israel doesn't want a war. So their own soldiers are guarding the Temple Mount to keep that from happening. So the only somebody, and of course it ranks in one of the most holy places other than Mecca ranks first. The Temple Mount, I think, probably second. And uh, so you know, you know, you as believers know, amen, this is the only reason the devil wants that land because it's God's. Amen. That's where the Lord will set up, amen, his throne during the thousand-year millennial reign. Amen. And in that same spot in the center of the planet, in the new earth, amen, will the new city, Jerusalem, comes down. And there the Father will set up his throne. And the earth will be the capital of the universe. Amen. So there are exciting days ahead of us. Amen. But there are yet battles to be won. Praise the Lord. Amen. So in the meantime, it is imperative that you learn how to give yourself to travail. Hallelujah. In Luke chapter 22, verse 43, it says, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, being the Lord, strengthening him, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. Now, notice that. Notice the wording. Being in agony. This is not something that was created independent of the Lord. This is something that is driven by Holy Spirit with the help of the angels. Amen. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, travail can be as such. I doubt if we would ever reach that intensity. Amen. Because the Lord was without sin and fault. Amen. And so up and during this time, the Lord, praise God, is walking around in an eternal body like Adam had. He is the second Adam. So he had the same type of body Adam had. 
it was not until the Lord became sin that he began to age and die. Amen. And of course, he became sin on the cross. So, it was not a mortal body. It was not an immortal body. It was an eternal body that renewed itself. Amen. At what age? At the age that he died. <laughs> Praise God. That's why everybody in heaven looks around 30-ish. Praise the Lord. So the idea then of Christ sweating drops of blood is about being in such deep travail that one goes from the shedding of deep tears to the sweating of drops of blood. And I can tell you now, I've been in a lot of travail, but I've never shed blood for my brow. Amen. I doubt if I ever will. Amen. However, travail can be that deep. So now, with that said, then the angels could not have then helped him or ministered to him during this time if they did not understand travail. They had to understand travail. And as we'll see in Scripture, they get involved with travail as well. So with that said, so you, you need to know one of the ministry then of the angels, very important ministry that I don't hear people talk about is to help you as a born-again Christian. You know, I always say that phrase, born again. Why? Because there are a lot of people calling themselves Christians that are not born again. An important distinction. To help born-again Christians understand travailing with tears. That's one of the ministry of the angels. And how, how, not just to understand it, how to become involved and travailing with tears. Now, this is something that the Father, uh, their ministry has been heightened in this area, in this transition that we just went into, we just moved into. Amen. And take it from, uh, um, take my word from, from, from experience. You learn how to flow with Holy Spirit doing travail. Okay. And we'll explain that even more. So when our father has angels travailing, like those do at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, it means then that the travailing in tears is important in these days. It's one of the, the, one of, um, the most important meanings as far as heaven is concerned. Everything is pointing to what? Everything we do, even your path, your walk with the Lord, is pointing toward what? The return of the Lord. You making yourself ready, right? So, so, then, everything then is, is pointing to the final preparations that is being made for the Lord's return. Now, did you know, did you know, before you became a Christian because when you were born, when you came out of your mother's womb, four angels were, six were assigned, two in heaven, four were take their place with you by your mother's bedside the moment you came out of her womb. Now, if you're not born again, before you leave the age of accountability, they step back from you but they don't leave. They step back. What do you mean step back? You do not feel their influence. Amen. You do not sense their presence. And they are very limited by what they can do for you. Okay? But you don't lose them. So one of the main things that they do, okay, if that doesn't happen to you, Meaning you don't get saved before you leave the age of accountability. And even before then, one of the main things they do is what? Travail for you in prayer that you can become born again and miss hell. See, this is a passion. 
as, as created beings, the Lord put certain strong passions inside of them. Okay? They don't know all things. And because of their rank, they're the Lord's rank when it comes to angelic beings. And so their understanding of certain things concerning salvation is very limited. But certain things are, they have a gro- they have a they have a strong awareness, revelation of, and one of those things is you missing hell. Amen. Because they passed their test. They did not fall with Lucifer. And because they did not fall, they were sealed. They could not fall now if they wanted to. Amen. See, this is a part of God doing what? Dealing with their mind and taking away that horrible event. So things are remembered in heaven by the Holy Spirit when he wants you to remember them. Even now, saints that are in heaven, they are only remembered certain things as ministry go on in heaven concerning them. Prayer, or if you see them in heaven. Amen. That awareness comes right then and there. Without, amen, all of the, you know, ugly influence of earth that they remember. So the point I want to make is there is a strong, and I can, and even, even words cannot, can, doesn't do it justice by the passion they feel in travailing for you that you miss hell. Amen. So these are one of the strong passions that God put inside of them. Now, Matthew chapter 23. Look at it. Matthew 23 and verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. Quote, this is the Lord doing his ministry. And stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together even as a hen gather her chickens under her wings, and you would not. They wouldn't let him. Now, hearing that story, as a human, how does that affect your heart? They wouldn't let him. So stop and think then. How would it affect God's heart? Now, there's another thing that you have to... Be, uh, understand and un- none of us in our fallen state have ever experienced deep passions the deep passions of heaven it's probably a way to put it now we have experienced deep passions but from a dark side right many of us have experienced deep passions of betrayal Right? Right? Many of us have experienced deep passions um, of rejection. See? And it varies with us as humans. Now, if you can think about that, deep passions from a positive perspective, the character of God, Even when we fall in love, as earth says, and marry, you know, as humans, you do not plunge the depth of that love. Amen. If you do not plunge the depth, length, and breadth of the love of God, You cannot plunge the depth of human love. It is impossible. Huh? If you do, tell me this. How can you fall out of love? Right? Now, I'm probably said this one ain't in my notes, but Holy Spirit probably said, I've said it before. It's not something I like saying. When I got a divorce, 
Matter of fact, I resisted it for two years. Until Holy Spirit told me to do it. To give her what she wanted. I was shocked even by his statement. But I did. He said, of course, having a piece of paper that you are divorced, what does that do with your heart? My heart is still in love. So I don't understand this thing about people who say they fall out of love. I don't comprehend that. See, the thing is, what you do to yourself, you have to pay for it. It will come back and haunt you or bite you in some way if you don't let heaven deal with it. You know what I'm saying? Things in all of our paths before we got saved, you're dealing with stuff right now that is haunting you. Amen. That's what the overcoming life is all about. Heaven helping you deal with stuff and overcome it. Remember I say all the time there are three parts of you. And each part of you has its own agenda. <laughs> That's why Thessalonians said they must become one. They must. This is what's so fascinating about the Godhead. Their oneness. Amen. And their great love for each other. So... So when Jehovah Sneaky, you won't find it in one of his names. So when Jehovah Sneaky asked me to remarry, I told him I could not. I'm still in love with someone. I said to him, if you want me to do that, you have to take that love out of me. Because if I went and did it anyway, it is not fair to that person. Right? I said it's not fair to that person for me to go and marry or put a ring on their hand. And I'm still in love with somebody else. <laughs> right? So, he did. He did. The Lord literally took, took the love I had for my ex-wife out of me. Took it out of me. And so when he did that, and then when he told me that I have someone else for you, I said, well, Lord, if you want me to marry this person, you're going to have to put the love for them in me. I don't love him. I'm not even attracted to him. You're supposed to be honest with God. <laughs> he knows it anyway, right? And he did. And people are shocked when I say to them, we never dated. We didn't even live in the same country. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And so, I can say this, attest this to the truth. When he put her inside of me, that certain things are difficult to explain. You know how, this is why we always describe things about Feeling it in our belly, right? I just feel it. I feel it in my stomach. You know how we say jokingly about our emotions, right? Well, um, when it comes to your um, immune system, most of it is in your stomach. You know that, right? In your belly. 
So all truths are parallel. So the same thing is applicable when it comes to spiritual things. Amen. The Holy Spirit is in your belly. He flows like rivers out of your belly, right? Right? Whether you know it or not, when your spirit is in your body, it's like a ball of light right here in your belly. When it comes out, it takes shape and form just like your natural body. See, so, so there is a spiritual truth in parallel. So with that said, with that said, when you have a passion for someone, okay, I'm talking about a real passion. Encompassing the word passion is love or feelings, right? It's here in your belly. It's like when you think of the Lord, when I think of the Lord, I feel him right here in my belly. Hard to describe. <laughs> I can say it in tongues. <laughs> Hard to describe. I feel him. Now, if you've ever been in love, you know what I'm saying. It's like something hits you here. And within that is the passion for the individual, right? It's, you don't, it's not in your head you feel them, okay? You think about them there, but you feel them here, right? Now, if it's lust, you just feel them between your legs. That's the difference. Love is different. And so, when he did that, the same way that I'm aware of the Lord, I may not even be thinking about him. I will feel him here first, and then I will think about him. Exactly the same way when he put love for her inside of me. Exact same way. See? If he had not done that, and he knows it, I never would have married. Never would. It would have been impossible. Amen? <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? All right. You understand more as I go along. So, in the spiritual sense. Now, I gave you Matthew 23, 37, right? Right? Did I read it? I read it. Okay. Now look at Luke 13, 34. Now this is Jesus, his passion and his love for, for the Hebrew people. The scripture is displaying, showing that passion to you, to you and that love that he has for them. Luke 13, 34. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killeth the prophets. Now this is just a sister scripture of Matthew. Each one of them wrote about this incident. And stone is them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Amen. Now the same thing is applicable to the earth today. That's why Jesus died. He wants to gather those that are not living for him under his wings. Right? Right? But many refuse. Many refuse. You have many who have given their life to the Lord once, but they walked out from under his wings. They're not under his protection. Right? There is a relationship established, but no fellowship. Right? The scripture calls this being backslidden. Now, you can backslide and never leave the church. <laughs> Sitting right in the pew. I guess this is how people divorce. Sit right in the home. And the relationship separates. Right? Within, right? It's not something that happens overnight. 
So the scripture lets us know then what? Your heart, you are in control then. When I say heart, I'm not talking about this thing that beats blood. It is your responsibility to do what? Keep your heart toward the Lord. Right? Amen. If you are married, it is your responsibility to keep your heart toward that individual. Amen. Because in our fallen state, the enemy will do what? Steal your heart. Amen. And move you toward a relationship not sanctioned by the Lord. All right? Now, Luke 19, 41. And when he was come near... He beheld the city. Now look at the passion of the Lord. Now remember everything I said to you about passion in your heart, in your belly. He came near the city and did what? Wept over it. Wept over it. Now, in, our, in the first text that I gave you, Matthew 23. Now this happened while Christ was approaching the city of Jerusalem in the first text. Okay? Riding on a donkey. That's when this happened. Riding on a donkey, being honored by a crowd. You know the story. He was honored by a crowd of people, and this was the first Palm Sunday. Okay, the very first Palm Sunday. Now, there are two times that Holy Spirit had these particular words, and we're going to look at these words for a minute. There are two times he had these particular words of Christ recorded in the Bible. Now, the reason for this is that it shows that there was an attitude about the people of that day in the city that was with Christ around him the whole time of his ministry on this earth. And his ministry centered around Jerusalem, okay? Now, he went out in suburbs, what we would call suburbs, but primarily it centered around Jerusalem. Now, this is the same attitude Christ expressed when he wept, okay? This attitude that they had of him was deeply in his heart when he wept, all right? You follow me? As he viewed the city of Jerusalem on that first Palm, first Palm Sunday, now, what was the attitude? He had a very deep burden. See, this awareness, let's use this word, which is better described, this revelation, this truth, right? Let's get an example, an example. How many of you thought someone felt a particular way about you and you found out differently? <laughs> huh? Right? You with me? You found out that, now, it, it could have been from a lover perspective or just a deep, deep, deep friend. Right? So let's say from a friendship perspective. You would have did anything for this individual. But then you found out this person didn't care about you <laughs> the way they portrayed or said. Now, how did you feel? Think about it. If you were ever in that position. If you have not, then you can't relate to what I'm saying. Did you feel betrayed? Did you feel used? Huh? See, now, again, see, we were talking about what? Passions early. Passions. When it comes to negativeness, our passions run deep because of our fallen nature. Betrayal. Some people have been moved to murder because of deep passions, right? And betrayal, right? Right? Oh, okay. So, I mean, if you don't know that for a reality, you watch movies, you watch TV, right? <laughs> Amen. And people found out they didn't love me. And they go mad, right? And it moved them to murder. See, this is 
this is the negative side of passion that brings destruction. destruction. It is the opposite of the character of Christ. The, uh, the opposite. Now, as a believer, as a Christian, you have both passions in you. The fallen nature, the Adamic nature, and the nature of Christ. It is your responsibility as a Christian, amen, to live your life in honor of Christ and obedience, amen, and that positive, positive love, long-suffering, temperance, patience, those positive characteristics dominate your life, right? It all stems out of what? Love, all right? So I'm just describing to you. Now, it, 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 even in the description, it is impossible. But we can relate somewhat in the depthness of the passion, if you've ever been there, okay, from a positive sense. So you can understand now, here's Christ. He's looking over Jerusalem, and all of a sudden, deep within him, a revelation, which he was aware of all along, but it was magnified on the inside of him that what? These people don't want me. Now, unbeknownst to me, I always thought that Christ weeping and drops of blood in the garden, I always thought it was in retrospect to his own life, but it was not. The Holy Spirit showed me it was not. You know what it was in retrospect to? The rejection of the people. See, this is the power of travail. This is the power of of the love of God through travail. See, when someone, life is messed up of they don't want you and you can't reach them with words. You can't reason with them. You can't convince them. You feel hopeless, right? Well, as a believer, we can go beyond that. See? But you need a revelation from heaven concerning the predicament or what has entrenched itself in the life of that person. All right? Now, this is the thing about travail. This is the thing about intercession. It takes the place of another. Right? Now, remember Job said. Now, Job didn't have the New Testament. Okay? And he had a revelation of intercession, but... He couldn't find anyone. He said, I need someone. Now, this is my translation, but this is the gist of what he says. In his predicament, in his, in his battle through life where he lost his children and lost all of his wealth and lost everything, and he felt like just dying. And then here he is now, sick, and his body is full of boils all over. And he's scraping dead meat off of his body. And he sits there in sackcloth and ashes is what they did, you know, when they're in mourning or in prayer. And his heart is, I need someone to pray for me. But not just pray. See, see, not just pray. So many Christians, in retrospect to prayer, if somebody says that, Pray for me, or you know someone needs prayer. We just utter a few words, you know, just to salve our conscience that we said something, but that's it. <laughs> right? I'm talking about something that goes much beyond that, that most of the church knows nothing about. Do you hear me? And this is what the angels come to help you with. See? So when you talk about travail, then, so that means there must first come a, a deep revelation of the one that you are standing in the gap for. A deep revelation. All right? So this, was, this, was, this is what was happening with the Lord. Okay? He gets off of the donkey, amen, after they've thrown all of these palm trees upon him and hollering, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, these are the same people that later on they holler, crucify, kill that so-and-so, the same one three years later, right? That's what natural human love would do. It will turn to hatred overnight. 
That's the will. It is entrenched in betrayal. See, but the love of God, the seed of Christ inside of you, will be shared abroad in your heart to overcome natural human love if you let it. See, as easy as a believer, I can stop the love of God from flowing inside of me and move into natural human love and act just as foolish as the next person. You know what I'm saying? It's your choice. It's your choice. Well, it's all about love and affection. It's all about allegiance. Your allegiance must not be to a person on this earth. Your allegiance must be to the Lord. Huh? When your allegiance is to the Lord, you will put up with anything when it comes to people. When your allegiance is to the Lord. But you must have a what? A revelation of the Lord. Right? Who he is. Now, there are a lot of people that know his name, but they don't know him. They know about him, but they don't know him. Right? Now, this is what the Holy Spirit come to do. To bring a revelation of who Jesus is. Amen. So, so here he is. He gets off the dunk. He's walking alone, and then he looks over the city, and it hits him. These people don't want me. And because they don't want him, he knows by revelation what's going to happen to them. This is what causes him to weep. It hits in him. This deep burden. Huh? Within his inner spirit, because he knows they are going, the predominant of them are going to reject him. All right? That's what moved him to tears then. That's what caused him to drop sweats of blood from his tears in the garden. Those two things. All right? He knew that, <laughs> he knew that three years later, the Romans would come in and totally destroy the city. He knew this. This is why he said this. He knew that the Romans would come in, and it was 70 AD, and destroy the temple. See, the temple was the Jews' very life. The temple is what connected them to God. Right? Right? You, you take away the temple, they had nothing. I'm glad today, brother, sister, we don't bow down to statues, neither do we worship buildings. I'm glad Christ in us, the hope of glory. Huh? That was the mystery. That was the mystery that the angels didn't understand. That God will come inside of you. <laughs> huh? This is what sets Christianity apart from any other religion. And this is why Jesus Christ is the only way. He is the door to heaven. Now, people, many people will argue with me about that. Let them argue. You can choose what you believe. Amen. I choose to believe in the Bible. Okay? And I know this fact even before, amen, well, no, well, after, I knew this, I was not, uh, how, how can I phrase this? <laughs> I wasn't aware of this fact to this degree, let me put it that way, before I was born again. Okay, <clears throat> because after I was born again, well, actually, I got born again really at the age of around 11, 12, 11, 12. A uh, uh, traveling evangelist came to my father's church and preaching. Now, 
I was about 11 or 12, so that means I had five other siblings. I'm, I'm almost in the middle. Five other siblings that were so older than me at that revival meeting. After the preacher got through preaching, I was the only one. Holy Spirit moved me to go to the altar. Now, here's the sad thing about all of this. Here I have a father who's a pastor, a preacher, and is anointed by God. Not called to be a pastor, but he's anointed to preach. But I didn't understand salvation. I did not understand nothing of what I understand about Christ, his awareness, his presence, what he is and what he could be. Then, okay, living in the back of a church, <laughs> the parsonage, all right? was not aware of it and so I knew it was Holy Spirit because I never would have did it myself I mean my brothers and sisters are there church was crowded something moved me to go to the altar and I did I said the sinner's prayer <laughs> it's a funny thing <coughs> I don't think it was the same night but somewhere during that week I remember my father calling me and <laughs> And so he's sitting in his favorite chair at home, and I'm standing in front of him, and he asked me, what happened to you? I'm sitting to myself, you know, dummy, you should be telling me what happened to me. <laughs> I don't remember the conversation exactly, because that was 50 years, over 50 years ago. <laughs> he asked me, what happened to you? Now, I knew I responded. I can't remember exactly. I, I, I do remember saying, I don't know. But if I don't remember if expounding on the I don't know, okay? And I don't remember his response. <laughs> it's been so long ago. But I thought about this the other day. And then it came back to me just while I'm preaching. So I know for some reason the Holy Spirit wants me to share it. And not understanding, not understanding this. Christ, uh, this is why I mentioned it, that who he is. Because there are many people that will argue with you. I mean, even the Pope himself is teaching there are many paths to God. Well, he's wrong. He's wrong. Of course, and I was thoroughly convinced of this when the Lord appeared to me in July 30, 1980. He appeared to me in a vision. He introduced himself to me. As God. He said, I am Christ. Christ means anointed one. But then he says, the I am. <laughs> the same I am that told Moses to go get Israel out of Egypt. Huh? God introduced himself to Moses as the I am. And that's what Christ introduced me, himself to me as. And then he said this. And what, what he said to me is the same thing in respect to you. He said to me, I have known you before the world ever existed. Huh? So that means, that's not, <laughs> that's not saying he knew me on some planet or something before I came to earth. Huh? He was creator. Amen. Now, this is after I was born again. This was doing his dealing with me to preach the gospel, which I didn't want to do. I wanted to be an airline pilot, a professional airline pilot. That's what I wanted to be. But he invaded my life. And he will invade yours if you let him. Hallelujah. Anyway, I digress. So here is the Lord, his passion. His passion. Now, he's being driven, okay, and somewhat pushed into this by Holy Spirit. See, this is what travail does. Well, I'm, I'm going to explain that to you later. So, here he is. He, he was suffering in his inner spirit. Because he knew that judgment would come to them. Okay? Now, 
Let's go a little bit deeper. You, you see, the, that awareness that Jesus had that moved him to travail, how does that work? How does that work? Why is that important to you? Because it is something that will greatly increase in the coming days. Okay? Now, of course, many of you know me, know I had six kids. I don't know anything about birthing babies, okay? A ne baby never been in my womb, all right? And so, but I've asked a lot of questions, okay? My children's mother, how does it feel? What happens to them? Now, I understand the biological significance, okay? You're reading about a book, in a, in, in a, reading about it in a book, but, you know, reading something in a book is just like, Reading about driving. <laughs> it's a totally different thing when you get behind the wheel, right? Well, it's the same way. And so I've, so, so I've, so I've, so I've asked the question. I believe the Holy Spirit is one that pushed me to it. Why? Because of the spiritual significance or the spiritual parallel in birthing, spiritually. Because there are spiritual births, okay? Now, remember, remember. There were two people that the Holy Spirit promised that they would see the Messiah before they died, right? Two, a prophet and a prophetess. Y'all remember that, right? And they both saw him around the temple. What were they doing in their old age prior to their death? They were praying for the coming of the Messiah, right? Right. That's what the scripture says. So they played a part in travail in prayer in what? Birthing the Messiah into the earth. Right? Now the scripture made that very, very plain. So what am I saying to you? It's not that God can do something without you. He can. He, only, he chose to do things with you and in conjunction with you. And one of these things is burdens or birthing things in the earth. Okay? God needs a body. To put it simply, God needs a body. God needs a body of a woman to bring a baby into this world. God needs a body of a human to birth his purposes into the earth. He needs a body. Okay? Now, as the intercessor, I understand that very, very plainly, very clearly. I prayed for people. I've stopped their deaths. I've stopped accidents. You know, um, just a few nights ago, I came in there like I normally do. Sat right there where baby was sitting. When I sat there, when I sat there, Holy Spirit, let me describe to you. The Holy Spirit takes the passions of the Lord. The passions of the Lord. What he feels. What he feels about something. And he first dumps it into your spirit. Now remember, the Lord Jesus through Holy Spirit lives in your spirit. He dumps it into your spirit with all of his emotions and passions. Now, in that dumping, now listen to me, revelation comes to you unconsciously. You're not conscious of what the Holy Spirit is talking. You're not conscious of the intricacies of what he's targeting, okay? Whether it's a person, place, or thing. But your spirit is, okay? And so when it, that revelation hits your spirit unconsciously, you, your spirit, responds. Your spirit responds by doing what? 
dumping what it feels into your soul, into your emotions. Right? And when it does, it, now you still, you are conscious of what's happening to you, but you're unconscious of why. All right? It's just like, it's just like, you say you parents who are alive. Your parents are alive. Or someone who you love very much. And I come to you and say, they just died. What happens to your emotions? Right? Something is dumped into your emotions from that revelation. Right? And from your emotions, it pushes tears out of you and you begin to weep. Now depending upon the person and what they meant to you will determine what? How uncontrollable that weeping is and how long you will weep. Right? In the same way. In the same way. Exactly the same way. Holy Spirit dumps the passion, the emotions, the feelings, what God has about what he's targeting, your spirit dumps it into your emotion, but again, you're still unconscious. Remember, that's three parts to you, spirit, soul, and body. And your brain still has yet to understand why or who or what, but you are still responding. That's what you must learn to do. Respond, yield to that passion. And it has happened to me enough that I am aware, I am aware, even when it is having gripped me, even when it hadn't gripped me. Now, see, it is, and as I talk, think back now, think back the times that you have moved from, you know, a somewhat soundness of mind where you have become hysterical. If that has ever happened to you, think back now the motions you went through. See, some, some, see, a lot of you have not analyzed that of yourself. Sometimes it's slow and sometimes it's fast, right? Boom. Just shh, overwhelms you. But think back for a moment while I'm talking. It is the exact same way spiritually. The exact same way. Sometimes it can come very slow. If it has happened to you enough within your spiritual to wish, intuition, you know that it's coming. See, there's times I'm aware that it's coming. Deep down in a, a part of me, not in my body, not in my head, deep down in a part of me, I'm aware it's coming, right? So, so the other night when I came and I said, now I was aware, but you don't know. You don't know how strong it will be, okay? Or if it will move you to tears. You don't know, okay? It is just yours to do what? Yeah, right? And so I sit down, and then now there's something about me. If I hear a certain song or something, you know, uh, that touches my heart. Some things that are triggers that will move you, right? Push you to that. Typically, doing travail or something, I don't stop, put on music, something like that. So you don't have time. Because being here, music is playing all the time, right? So, this is kind of strange. It's really funny. <laughs> but I'm sharing with you things I don't normally share because I want you to understand. Of course, we play the same song all the time. At a certain point in that song with no music, the song's kind of mixed normal. It's just music because no one's singing. At a certain point in all time, it triggers something always in my heart. So at that point, I sit down and at that point, and then it, poop tips it over. It's like pouring the water in the cup, and then it flows over, right? It tips it over. And then my emotions now dumps tears into my body. And then slowly, I begin to weep. 
and it gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And it is not something that is natural. It is not something you can do on your own. I've been in prayer meetings where people have tried to. It's not sustaining. It's not sustaining. If Holy Spirit is not com- com- compelling, compelling it, pushing it, so to speak, it's not against your will because you've yielded. See, I could have gotten up and when my actions and my emotions resisted it and pushed it back. See, that's one thing you have to learn about travail with strong tears. Sometimes it comes strong. Sometimes it slips upon you. You say, well, why do that? I don't know. I don't know everything. But I know this. The Holy Spirit always endeavoring to teach in everything that he does. He does not miss a teaching moment. Okay? So, and so, when you yield to it, it just, it's like you turn on a faucet. The water will keep coming, right, until you turn the faucet off. Okay? Well, Holy Spirit turned on the faucet. And the dumping flows from my spirit to my soul to my body. Okay? He turned the, I can turn it off if I don't yield. That's what you need to understand. He can turn it on, but you can turn it off if you don't yield. When, When you learn to yield, the faucet will stay on, so to speak. The burden will keep flowing out of you. The strong tears will keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. And all you have to do is simply yield. um, Saying keep keep crying is a misnomer. Okay, you can keep crying and there'll be no and, and, and the faucet be shut off. So that's why I don't say just keep crying. I say yield. Okay, because that, that is hard to explain. Yield. That's hard. I, I don't I don't know how. <laughs> it's something you have to learn while doing. Just like driving, you got to translate it from the book. To being behind the steering wheel, right? It's the same way with the burden of the Lord. All right? Why is that so important? Because the angels help you do that. Matter of fact, they weep with you. Remember the phrase, and the angels came and strengthened him? And then after it said that, and then it talked about his passion. Well, the strengthening is to help him to keep yielding. Right? After the strengthening, he came with stronger tears. Did you notice the phrase? After the fact. See? That's the angel's part. The Holy Spirit gets a hold of the angels. Gets a hold of you. Okay? And the angels, which is a part of their teaching, their learning, their ministry is to help you to yield. They help you make the connection between your spirit, soul, and your body. Your body. See, now when your body is overwhelmed emotionally, it's, it's, it's easy for your body. It'll succumb to it emotionally. Just like you yield to being happy. You respond to, to joyous news, Right? Depends upon the news will determine how long you will rejoice, right? Especially if somebody gave you a million dollars, right? You'll be still joined, see, five days later, right? In the same way. See, this is why the transition is different spiritually. Because the why and the who is known to your spirit, but not to your conscious mind. See? The emotions... And the overwhelmingness of it came to your spirit from a revelatory standpoint. And it dumps it into your soul. See? 
That's why yielding is so important. Because typically your body doesn't yield unless it is stimulated by sight or by revelation. Your body doesn't yield. See? So that's why it's important that you learn this. Again, why is it so important? It is something that would increasingly begin to happen to you. Increasingly. Why? Because of the harvest that's coming. Okay? How much time I got, Mo? Because of the harvest that's coming. Harvest. What do I mean harvest? Souls. Souls. The scripture says when Zion travailed. She brought forth her children. Travail. Just like a woman travails in birth. A woman does not begin travailing until the baby is in the birth canal. Until the baby turns his head, okay, downward, okay, and hits the entry of, and hits the entry of the wound and begin to contract. The woman's Muscles automatically begin to contract. And then what happens? Travail begins. Now, a woman couldn't stop that if she wanted to once it starts. Why? Same way spiritually. Same way I'm describing it. Once you yield, it's like turning the faucet on. <laughs> keep going. They keep going. They keep going. Right? Right? The only reason to stop is what we call, doctors call, false labor pains. <laughs> right? If it's not false, it ain't stopping once it starts. It is designed that way. It will push out whatever is in there. Okay? Now, the reason, the reason. There has not been more travailing and tears in the body of Christ. It's because of design. The Holy Spirit has not given burdens to certain ones. That's all it is. Because you as a Christian, you are one big wound, spiritual wound. Amen. The devil knows this. That's why he wants to possess you. That's why he wants your mind to birth his plans, right? You're one big spiritual womb. So it is the design of heaven. To put God's burden in you. To impregnate you. When that begins to happen, depends on the resistance and what it is. Let's say for instance. You're praying someone who, for someone who is not saved. Okay. And. At that moment. Something. Bad is getting ready to happen. To them. To the say to the ending of their life. Okay. And. The Lord don't want that to happen. Okay? So he goes through this process I just described to you. And so in, the, in this particular case, the spirit of death has went out. But death needs what? Death needs something in the natural to accomplish his plans, right? So death must move in the natural realm. Okay? Whether to take an, an animate object, okay, and wield it against a person, or to take another person, okay, fill them with darkness, to take a knife or a gun and move towards you, whatever the case may be. So that means now, while you're travailing, okay, with strong tears and groaning, then what happens? Then that means angels now go out. Toward that individual. And angels do what? They start fighting against. Okay. Demon spirits. 
that are trying to use something in the natural realm to take a life. Okay? Now, I know this because I've been involved in this. Okay? <clears throat> now, this has to be a part two to this, okay? Now, this wasn't the first time. This was probably, because I, I did this for my mother-in-law. Um, I did this um, for my two sons who had an accident, a head-on, um, my twin boys. Uh, I did this um, um, the, the one time was it was more intense and strong than any other time when I did it for Mo. Okay. And you all have heard the story. Went to the church, wasn't even on my radar. It was one o'clock in the morning. When, again, when I got there, I, did, I, I felt this awareness, what I described to you. So I got on my knees. When I got on my knees, now let me interject something. That was Holy Spirit taking hold with me. Okay? Or let me rephrase that. That's Holy Spirit trying to get me to take hold with him. Okay, just like a man and a woman come together and they take hold of each other and they make a baby, right? Burden, same thing. Now, if I hadn't yielded to Holy Spirit, took hold with him, then what he wants to stop, if he can't get somebody else, and usually he won't, depending on what he's doing and why, and the connection, right? Well, in this particular case, I was his pastor. Okay, because he's backslidden. So I was his pastor, all right? So now there are times when, and this is the opposite that doesn't happen much. When we see something going on, or we see trouble lying ahead. Are we aware of our loved ones entrenched in trouble, you know, in darkness or, or strongholds in their life. And we don't know or not consistent in trying to get Holy Spirit to take hold with us. See, it works both ways. Now, how come, why is that not so? Now, here's the thing. It's because we don't have significant revelation enough as to what is going on with the person. See, that's what is needed. It needs to move you like it did Jesus. A spiritual passion must grip you to the degree where it gives birth into your womb. And then strong tears come. See? And so now when the Holy Spirit is bringing it, then he brings all that. But what happens when you is trying to get him to take hold with you? You don't have the passion. Right? You don't have the burden. Okay? Now, it may be your loved one. It may be someone that's close to you. But you don't still don't have sufficient passion to meet the spiritual criteria to trigger the burden. Okay? So you need Holy Spirit. So what do you need? Then you need Holy Spirit to drop revelation inside of you concerning that individual and what they are warring with, what they are bound by, huh? what they are struggling with, okay? If you don't get that, then they're, they're hopeless. You hear what I'm saying? They are hopeless. So, so anyway, so I come, I get on my knees, and then, just like I told you, all the describing the emotions, boom. And I begin to weep, strong tears. And as usual, 
consciously? I don't know who it's for or what it's about. But my spirit knew. Okay? My spirit knew. My unconscious mind knew, but my conscious mind did not. I did not know that he was about to be shot three times consciously, but my spirit did. Okay? So with that awareness and that it would bring death and him ending up in hell, just like Jesus saw it concerning Israel, then my spirit was moved emotionally, passionately. Okay? But it was all done by Holy Spirit. A unconscious revelation, right? Now, I was not conscious of the revelation until after I got through praying. See, the burden and, and the, the strong tears, it went on for about 45 minutes. And then it stops. No pushing, just yielding. Is the same way it feels like when you yield, like somebody steps in your body and uses your body to cry and cry and cry and then get done and then leave. <laughs> That's exactly what it feels like. Okay? It can be so strong to almost live like it's two of you. But you're in control. You're always in control. All right? And so, an hour, probably less than an hour. The phone rings. This is 2 a.m., okay? No, I take that back. I'm sorry. I, I get up. So I'm thinking to myself, ooh, we're going to have a ball of a service the next day. Mm, that's why I connected it to, right? Because we were renting from someone. So at the time, our service was like 2, 2, 2, 2 in the, in the evening. An hour, two hours before the service, someone calls me, Pastor, Pastor, Mo been shot. So I know now, now I know, that's who all my traveling was for, okay? So the person tells me where he is. I don't know how that person found out. I never asked him, did, they, did, they, did the person call him, I, I, which I doubt, but I don't know how that person. It was an old member. And so I leave the church because I'm at the church, and I go to the hospital. So he's been in ICU for two, three, four hours. They just rolling him out into, into um, intensive care. So I walk in. He still woke. I walk in, and I look at him. I said, well, we knew it was coming to this, didn't we? He said, yeah. I said, well, you know you're not going to die, don't you? He said, yeah. I said, you know what you got to do, don't you? He said, yeah. He said, I left. <laughs> left because I had a service to preach, right? And so I got my preach, and then, you know, Patricia, see, I tell her later what happened. She said, you going to go back and see him? I said, yeah, I'll go back in a few days. I'm going to let him stew a while. That's what I say. <laughs> I'm going to let him stew a while. So several days later, I go back. He's in his own room now. And so I tell him what happened to me, Right? So I look at him and say, now this young man that died in his lap, I saw earlier that day when I came to his apartment. I saw him. He introduced him to me. So I asked him, do you think God loved that young man more than he did you? He said, no. I said, if it wasn't for the Holy Ghost and the burden of the Lord, you be burning the hell right now next to your crony. Right now. Then I come to find out later, this young man who was high when Mo introduced him to me, probably couldn't pick me out of a crowd. Well, his mom used to live up here. And she went to a Pentecostal church. So I ask you a question. Why is that young man dead today? Is God, cause God, does God do favorites? No. See, it's about grace and mercy. It's about knowledge and yielding. See? That's why I said to you the last time we were together, the best way that you can help your loved one 
who is not saved is to become a friend of God. When you have a friend that sticks closer than a brother, your friend will do things for you that they won't do for anybody else. That's God. That's God. But that puts a great price pressure on you. You must live a life pleasing to God. A life of obedience to find favor. Do you hear me? The same way when God came to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he stopped by Abraham's tent and said, I must tell my friend before I do this. Right? But not just because of that. Lot's nephew was in that city. God came to destroy. <laughs> and if he didn't give him out of the city, Lot will die with them. Can you see the favor of God and the friendship of God? Why did God do that? His friend. Now check this out. And this is why the purposes of God are beyond finding out. Even though Abraham interceded that he would not destroy the city, the city was still destroyed. But Lot was saved. Right? Lot was saved. See, to this degree, brother, sister, you will not know the level and impact on lives that you have made until you stand before the Lord. Neither will the people who you stand in the gap with will know. So anyway, I told him what happened to me. Then he tells me his story. He's laying on the bed and says, yeah. Oh, we were drinking. Well, doing drugs. Because he was selling drugs. Called himself a drug dealer. And uh, so all of, all of he said was three of them. They decided to go get some liquor. So he leaves his apartment. And then listen to him. This is his word. Something told me. Now he's backslid. Something told me don't go to that liquor store. But the guys with him kept pressuring him to go to that one. He didn't know whether because it was closer or someone set them up. He didn't know. So he gave in, gets into a rented car. He on the passenger seat. That boy I met that day is driving. He said there was someone in the back, which I don't know if he ever saw that boy again because he said he never came out. So they drive, pulls up. Someone comes and pulls in the same parking lot. And he thinks the boy that's driving knew the guys in the car. So the boy gets out, goes over to the car, comes back, says, hey, we gonna, we gonna, they want to buy some drugs. And so a guy gets out of that other car, gets in the back seat. Now he said he had never met the guy, I think this was words, but he knew of him. And he knew the police was looking for this guy because this guy had killed somebody else. And so the guy gets it back. They negotiate their little deal. And if I'm mistaken, he says, the reason the guy responded against him because the guy thought they had stole some drugs from him, something like that, if I got the story right. The guy says, gets ready to get out of the car, pulls out a 9 millimeter, and shoots this young man I met that day in the head, he falls over dead in Moe's lap instantly. He gets out of the car, gets in front of the car, in front of the liquor store. Starts praying the car with bullets. Moe said he took his seat and tried to throw it back to keep from getting hit. He gets hit nine times with a nine millimeter. Nine times. Bullets go in his leg. He got a rod in the knife. Bullet, doctors have me had bullets go in his neck, turn around and come back out. Bullets don't do that. He 
He's supposed to be dead today. No glory to me, glory to God. See, that's what travail and strong tears. Why did God do it? I don't know the full extent of it, okay? The mercy of God. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know him enough to have no deep, deep love for him, right? you know? He was still new in my life. But God did say this to him. One thing he did do. You think when he got shot, went back out, and still back to it again. You think, you know, you, you know, I mean, come on. I told him, one of the things I told him when he was in the landing debate, I said, listen, if you did have nine lives, eight of them are gone. <laughs> I remember saying that. <laughs> huh? So, one thing he would do, say the little drugs, and he would come in here, you know, shake all the little dope off the money, and then put, pay his tithes. <laughs> now, I told somebody, you taking drug money? I said, you better believe it. This is one dollar that won't get back in circulation with the devil. And I remember the one thing, and I know that was not the only reason, but that's one thing the Lord said to me. He said, just like Cornelius, his arms has came up as an offering unto me. I know that wasn't the only reason, but that was one of the reasons. God acknowledged that. Why do, why do I say this? Listen to me. I end with this. As we move on in time, the devil's intent, now it depends upon purpose and destiny, not importance. It's purpose and destiny. Depends upon the purpose and destiny of one connected to you who is not walking with God because the devil knows the end is near. Then what is his mindset? If I cannot have you, neither will God. So I will kill you. That's the devil's mindset. Do you hear me? Hear me today. And if you are not on watch, if you are not sensitive and yielded to Holy Spirit, when he moves to intervene, if you are not there, then that person's life will slip right through your hands. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? That is imperative in this season that we are in now. This is why Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is moving now to the level and to the degree that he is in this hour to deal with the wounds of his people. But not just that. It's because of the harvest. If Zion does not travail like a woman does giving birth, then God cannot get his spiritual children. God cannot get those who are lost in the earth into the family. See? So that means what? Based upon what we've been talking about, you need a revelation of what people mean to God. You hear me? Not just your loved ones, but people, what they mean to God. For God so loved the world, he gave his son to die for them when the world did not deserve him. Okay? You hear that, but you need a deep revelation of what that means to God. And as we establish 
earlier. You also need a revelation in your spirit of what your loved one at that moment means to God and what they are dealing with that will move you to travail. If that does not happen, if you can't get the passion of heaven, they will slip through your fingers and end right up in hell. Do you hear me? It is a terrible thing when God cannot shape a character. When God cannot shape a character and change it for the good. When that person refuses him. It's a terrible thing. See, I have lost people close to me. Okay. Because they slipped through one's finger because they did not pursue travail. Being, being in, you know, I'm, I'm, re I'm retired plumber, pipe fitter, and welder. So I traveled a lot. And my ex-wife got a burden for my grandfather. Now his wife had died two, three years earlier at the age of 83. My mom told my brother to call me. Called me, told me she was sick. I went and lied on the bed and talked to the Lord and said, should I pray? The Lord says, no, she's coming home. So I didn't bother to pray. Ain't no sense trying to get the Holy Ghost to take hold because it was his will for her to come. But I never told them, so she passed. A few years later, I'm in Prudhoe Bay, and my ex-wife get a burden for him. Again, both she didn't know at the time who it was for. And so, the kids at home, at that time, April and Kevin and the twins, she get the burden. She said they would come. Mom, 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 will you do this, will you do this? She stopped, go tend to them. Go back to pray. They come again. Mom, 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 would you do this? You do this. She stopped, tend to them, then go back to pray. The third time she did it, she didn't go back to pray. So, and matter of fact, I take that back. I wasn't in, I wasn't in Prudhoe Bay. I get to the house. I come to the door. First thing she says to me, your sister called and says your grandfather had a freak accident and died. He's living in the, the, what they call the country by himself. They tried to get him moving the city. He wouldn't. So she tells me this, and so I'm going straight to the room, and me and God are going to have it out. Because <laughs> I had this covenant with him. If anything happens to my loved ones, if I can do something about it, then you let me know, Lord. So this is a covenant I had with him. So I'm getting ready to have it out with him. And so she buzzes out and went to cry right when I step into the room. And she's yelling, it's my fault. It's my fault. So I run out into his, what's your fault? And she tell me the story that I just told you about the kids. God tried to stop it. It was not his time to die, even though he was 85 years old. But he could probably outrun all of you. His life slipped right through her fingers. That about broke her heart. I had to encourage her through that because when you fear, 
someone lose their life because you didn't stand in the gap. See, God doesn't want that in these coming days. You know what I'm saying? He does not want that. But you need to know that happens. Ignorance is one thing. But negligence is just something totally different. Of course, then I went and right called my sister. I said, well, what happened? She said, we, we still don't understand. It was really freakish in nature. Brother, sister, demons cause accidents. You hear me? Demons cause accidents. Demons move on people to do nasty things and commit murder. She said he had turned his little bone into like a garage. He didn't have a, a, a car door opener. He would get outside and open it. We pulled up in his car, got outside and opened it. And some, he, she don't know why he stooped down between the car and the thing. The, the car rolled some kind of way and pinned him to the building and killed him. Freak accident. When you hear people so freak, think demons. God tried to stop it. But he couldn't. Holy Spirit wants you to know today. Listen to these words very carefully. Holy Spirit wants you to know today. That he needs you. Heaven's purposes cannot be done without you. Come on, stand to your feet. Come on, just bow your heads for a moment. Holy Father, we thank you today for your great love for us. You who know all things, you know our past, present, and future. You know what lies ahead for each one of us. You know where any of our lives stand in jeopardy. And for what reason? I pray, Holy Spirit, for those who are in this room who do not walk with you as they should, that you would put an urgency within them of the hour, the times and seasons, and your soon return. That when you return, when that event happens, there will be no time. It would happen so fast, there will be no time to surrender their life. In the twinkling of an eye, as fast as lightning shoots across the sky, this event will happen, your return. I pray that you put this urgency within them. Those who stand here that live for you, have a passion for you, want more of you. I pray that you bring this awareness. It is time for them to stand watch. As the watchman stood on the tower and watched for the enemy to come and attack. Your people, your sheep, are the watchmen, are the intercessors who watch in the spirit and ready themselves against any attack of the enemy. Against them, your people, and their loved ones. I pray, Holy Father, that you would help them 
make themselves ready for the war that is at our doorstep. The war for the souls of men that are at our doorstep. And the urgency of the seasons and times. The victory that you desire to bring to them and their families. You are a good God. The word says you ever live it to make intercessions for them. Father, I pray. You bring this awareness to each of them. When you pray, high priest, when you drop to your knees before the throne of God and you weep uncontrollably for their destiny, for their life before the Father, That you also need someone in the earth to drop to their knees and take hold with you. I pray today you bring this awareness. That you let this revelation govern them from this day forward. Put a garrison within and without. A readiness of mind. That they would give themselves to prayer. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your love and mercy. Thank you, Father. Come on, just lift up both hands and thank God for his word. Hallelujah. We thank you, mighty King. Gracious, gracious Lord. You're so gracious. You're so gracious. It is not your will that any die and end up in hell. You made hell for the devil and his angels. Not for your creation. Not for man. Bless them today, Lord. Deep within their inner man. Bring the joy of victory within them. The joy of knowing that they stand ready for battle. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Lift your hands. Open your mouth and thank him. Give thanks. In my spirit, I know he will ready you. He will ready you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Deep within my inner man, I know he will ready you. Thank you, Lord. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you today, oh, wonderful King. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, I didn't finish.